BIA Media, Canada's top black media provider. Whether you're looking for content on fashion, art, music, or simple lifestyle, we bring you the best the black community in Ottawa has to offer, and so much more. And better yet, do you have a project you need help with? Well, look no further. We provide equipment, studio, and office space, as well as a team of dedicated individuals to help you bring those ideas to life. So don't wait. Check out our new website at biamedia.ca for more information on how to contact us and start creating today. BIA Media. Your media, your way. All right, greetings, everyone. Welcome to session six of our course, She Rose, African Women of Resistance. Um, we are the women who fought back, part one. And the reason why I call this part one is because uh, we won't be able to cover all the women I would like to in history in the eight weeks that we have, because we will have a hard stop um, in two weeks. So at the end of November will be our last class with this. But we will have part two uh, sometime in the future. Because in December and January, like I've been mentioning and will continue to mention, we will have our seminar on the Haitian Revolution and Haitian independence. So that'll be three weeks in December and three weeks in January. So uh, we will get into that soon, and the link will be available for that. As always, I want to just remind everybody that there is a course website and readings, materials associated with this course. So if you want to look deeper into anything that's discussed, um, if you want to share resources with other people, books, articles, book chapters, videos, please use the course website to do so. So we're going to get right into it, because uh, today we're going to focus on the end of enslavement um, in North America, and then we're going to focus on the beginnings of colonization in Africa. And we're going to talk about how these two things are linked. And we're going to talk about, of course, the women that led the resistance against them. So the women that fought, particularly we're going to focus on Harriet Tubman today in the North American context and her role in the ending of, of, of slavery. And then we're going to focus in West Africa and look at the uh, career and the circumstances of Yah Santiwa, the uh, Ajesu Hini, or the Queen Mother of Ajesu, and that, which part of the Ashanti Confederacy. So we're going to look at her career in the second part of class. So I want to go back, though, and review a little bit to talk about what we talked about last week, because it has direct implications for this history that we're going over today. So we, we're still talking about the transfer of millions of African women and men to the Americas, South America, the Caribbean, and North America. And our focus today, again, will be on the Caribbean and North America. And last week, we talked about the Haitian Revolution and the ripple effect of those African women and men that revolted and created the world's first nation that was born out of a slave revolt, independent nation born out of slavery, born uh, out of the struggles of African women and men. Remember, we always have to remember two thirds of the folks that fought for Haitian independence were born in Africa. So this is an African revolution that just takes place in the Americas. So when this happens, the ripple effect is huge. And we talked about it. We talked about what happened in Cuba. We talked about what happened in Jamaica and Barbados with uh, uh, Africans taking inspiration from the Haitian Revolution, the Europeans trying to stifle the Haitian Revolution, the rumor about it, the news about it, trying to stifle Haitian independence, all of these things. But the news spread and also had ripple effects in terms of the politics, even among the Europeans. One of the things that we did mention, the British slave trade, um, right before the Haitian Revolution, in fact, and a lot of this you can learn about you want to learn about the interactions between the uh, British and the Spanish and all these folks uh, as a result of the Haitian Revolution, read the book The Black Jacobins, Black Jacobins by C.L.R. James. This is one of the definitive histories of the Haitian Revolution. We'll talk about this more in December. But in that book, he makes a very good point that right before the Haitian Revolution, when Saint-Domingue was the richest colony in the world, the British wanted to disrupt that, uh, the wealth of the French, because that was their rival in Europe. So what the British were proposing, particularly after the American Revolution, which was another pivotal event that had key implications for African people. After the British lost the American colonies, and they're seeing the rise of San Domingo as being the richest colony in the world, the British want to put a, 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 a wrench in this development. So what they do is they start debating, we should end the slave trade, not slavery, but the trade of Africans coming from Africa 
to the Caribbean and to the Americas uh, for, uh, to be exploited. Now, there were some people in British that were true abolitionists and true humanitarians that were saying we should end the slave trade because it's disgusting and it's, it's you know, just a horrible crime against humanity. But the politicians and the businessmen in Britain, their reasoning for ending the slave trade was economic. They said, we got enough slaves in Jamaica and Barbados and the other places that we control. We already lost the Americas. If we stop the slave trade, it'll be more difficult for the French to get enslaved people into Haiti, and it will lessen their economic development, lessen our competition. So this was an economic calculation among the British. This is one of the reasons, even when they were debating this in the 1770s, uh, this is one of the reasons people think that the American colonists decided now is a good time to get independence from, from Britain as well, because in the course in the south of the US, um, they depended on slave labor. So, all of these things are happening. But then when the Haitian Revolution uh, sparks off, we see this whole idea of slavery being ended and the slave trade being ended come back into the picture again. And the British are much more advanced than the French and much more advanced than the uh, Americans because they realize, what Adam Smith and some of these other British econo uh, economists realize, you could still exploit African labor without them being in chattel slavery. You can do it through free labor. You can get the same amount of production. In fact, it's less costly. You don't have to worry about these rebellions constantly. You don't have to worry about uh, uh, all the, the, the insurance that you need for the slave trade. No, we can redirect those funds. We can use free labor. We can still exploit the labor of African people. The British realized that first. The northerners in North America then realized that. The Canadians realized that. So they start doing gradual emancipation and these types of things. But these other places, they don't realize that. So it's a very important point. One of the, another issue, another event that happens around this same time, 1795, that has direct implications for Africa, and we also see African women involved in this as well. We see the movement of the Second Maroon War in Jamaica, 1795. Uh, we already talked about Nanny of the Maroons. Well, that's the first Maroon War. The second Maroon War happens, and at the end, the Maroons are defeated by the British and some Maroon allies that the British had. We'll talk about that later on. And part of their, the, the ending of that war is 500, a little bit over 500 of those Maroons are transferred from Jamaica to Nova Scotia. And when they're in Nova Scotia, they don't like it, they don't like the, the climate, they don't like the treatment that they have, so they petition to go to Sierra Leone, which is the British's base in West Africa that they've been using and will continue to use as a place to help them fight against the slave trade. So any Africans that are being exported from Africa by the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch, or the French, and they're caught by British naval ships, those Africans are then transported to Nova, uh, excuse me, to Sierra Leone. No matter where they came from, whether they're coming from Nigeria or Guinea or even Congo, they're taken to Sierra Leone. But they're not the only Africans taken to Sierra Leone. The, one of the founders of this colony, one of the key Africans uh, that played a role in the establishment of this colony was Thomas Peters. But one of the people that's not mentioned alongside Thomas Peters is his wife, Sally Peters. And these were African revolutionaries that play a role in the Sierra Leone story. Thomas Peters was born in Nigeria, captured and enslaved in the Carolinas in the US. When the American Revolution sparked off, Africans were now presented a choice by the British. The British tell the Africans, if you fight for us, we will give you freedom. So if you break away from slavery, and you're able to make your way to the British troops, we will arm you, you'll be free, and you will help us fight against the Americans, the revolutionaries. 25,000 Africans fought in the American Revolution. 5,000 fought for the Americans. 20,000 fought for the British because they were given them this offer. Now, in histories and in Canadian history and things, you'll see this term, loyalist. These were black loyalists, as if these black folks like Thomas Peters had some type of love for the British crown. That's not why they were fighting. They couldn't care less about the British. They were fighting because the British said, if you fight for us, will give you freedom. And that's a great offer. Wait, you're going to give me freedom and I get to shoot at enslavers? Sign me up. So that's what they did. So Thomas Peters was one of them. 
But what, in these stories of loyalists, of what they call black loyalists, you don't hear a lot about these African women that also made the same sacrifice and, uh, and, and calculation. And his wife, Sally, was one of them. She also escaped from a plantation, got connected with the British, and joined something called the Black Pioneers Corps. These were the black men and women that fought for the British against the Americans during the revolution. And Sally Peters was one of them. But her history is just kind of told adjacent to Thomas Peters. There's no statue to Sally Peters, but she deserves just as much praise. And we're going, we see this type of history in the record where whenever rebellions are talked about or, or uh, Africans making decisions to fight for their freedom, we see it gendered as male, that we talk about these male figures, but somehow their wives and mothers and sisters get pushed to the background. So we're trying to rectify that when we talk about Sally Peters. And I wish there was a statue to her, because what she did, she fought alongside her husband. The British ultimately lose. The British then take these Africans to Nova Scotia. When these Africans like Sally Peters and Thomas Peters and others get to Nova Scotia, they're encountered with racism. They were promised land, not given land. They were promised uh, their freedom, they're forced into labor. They're forced into uh, discriminatory practices in Nova Scotia. So they want to leave. And they want to go to West Africa. So they end up going to Sierra Leone. And they're some of the first pioneers in Sierra Leone. And when they get there, they're still under the control of a white company, a British company. And Thomas Peters and his wife Sally revolt against this. They're writing, they're petitioning uh, the crown to say, hey, you know, we're veterans, we fought for you, we did this thing, and, and we're free people. We don't want to be under the, in Africa, at the, uh, uh, to be uh, quite blunt. I mean, they're in Africa still being controlled by a British company. And they revolt against us. So Thomas Peters is one of the heroes of this, and his wife Sally Peters is another. Other women whose names just go quickly passed us in the historical record, are really given a lot of attention in a relatively new book. This book came out in, um, let me give you the year. What is the year of this publication? 2021, so about two years ago. A book called Wake, The Hidden History of Women-Led Slave Revolts by Rebecca Hall. It's a graphic novel. A graphic novel is a book um, very much like, almost like a comic book, but more for adults and young adults. And these are great ways to teach history, particularly to young people, particularly to middle school students, high school students. And Dr. Rebecca Hall wrote this book, and I encourage everyone to get a chance to, to get this if you can, because it talks about some women whose names, um, sometimes their names are lost. One woman in particular, she's just known in the record as the Negro Fiend woman, because her and her indigenous husband in New York killed a slave, the, the family that enslaved them. They butchered them, they killed them. Uh, and, and then ultimately her husband was hung and uh, some of the other co-conspirators were killed and she was burned at the stake because that was the punishment for, for women who revolted against uh, slavery. And this happened in New York. You have women like Nanny Prosser. Nanny Prosser was the wife of Gabriel Prosser. Gabriel Prosser in Virginia in the year 1880 um, revolted against the uh, uh, system of slavery in Virginia. His plan was to destroy the colony and, and get free. His wife was one of the key uh, plotters and strategists of the rebellion. And we don't even know what happened to Nanny Prosser. The historical record is silent on what her fate was after the revolution. So you have all of these women. In Denmark Vesey's rebellion in South Carolina, 1822, which is directly related to Haiti, because Denmark Vesey said, we're going to take over the colony. We're going to rob the banks, take over, get guns, and then we're going to sail to Haiti. That way we can truly be free. This is 1822. His wife was intimately involved in the strategy and planning and execution of that rebellion as well, before snitches, of course, sold out both of these, both the Prosser's and the, the Vesey's rebellions. But all over, in New York in 1712, African women were burning down uh, uh, parts of what's now Times Square and other places, one of the largest rebellions in the North. So African women were playing all of these roles throughout this entire period in North America, in these rebellions. But often the historical record doesn't give them the credit that they're due, if they're even named at all. So very important to point those out. 
So what we're going to talk about today, I just wanted to get into that. We're going to talk about Harriet Tubman first, and then we're going to go over to Ghana. And the reason why we're talking about these, these two events in tandem is because of Harriet Tubman's Ghanaian connection. There is a statue to Harriet Tubman in Ghana in the uh, town of Ubu, uh, uh, Aburi, because it's believed that this is where Harriet Tubman's family came from. So this statue is there. She's honored there. And it's really important that we keep that connection between slavery and colonialism, because it's really one phenomenon. It's, slavery is taking African labor out of Africa to be exploited. Colonialism is exploiting African labor and African resources in Africa. And they're directly related. One immediately follows the other. And in fact, they actually overlap, if we really look at it. Um, because slavery ends in the Americas, the last place in Cuba in 1885. And so and colonization has already begun. The Berlin Conference has already uh, happened by the time slavery ends in Cuba in 1885. So these two things are connected. And it's always important for African people, Afro-descendant people in the Americas to remember that African connection. Harriet Tubman didn't just emerge in America without a family connected to uh, struggle and civilization and culture in Africa. So she's honored on both sides of the Atlantic. And after today's discussion, you're going to see why. Because too often her life is just limited to, oh yeah, she got free and then she freed other people on the Ground Railroad and that was it. She did so much more. And when you limit it to just statements like that, you don't really get the impact of probably one of the most fearless human beings to ever exist in world history, human history. Completely fearless. I mean, this is, this is the personages that, that we're talking about today. So Harriet Tubman, birth name, uh, Armita Ross, was born in 1820, passed away in 1913. She grows up in the eastern shore area of Maryland in the upper south in the US. Relatively large family, all pretty much enslaved in the same uh, place, and which was really important. So when she comes of age in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, because of the Haitian Revolution, the US has doubled in size. We talked about this last week. Napoleon needed money to finance his wars of conquest in Europe. He's run out of money because he now does not have San Domingue, the, the great you know, money maker that was Haiti. So he ends up selling the Louisiana Territory to Thomas Jefferson in the United States relatively cheap. So that doubles the size of the US. With this new territory, US slave owners in the South are also considering, well, if we can, as these, this territory gets divided up into different states, how do we ensure that some of these states are slave states? Because we got this new crop. Well, it's not a new crop, but a new way of uh, exploiting this crop, which is cotton. By this time, the late 1700s, the early 1800s, the cotton gin has been created by Eli Whitney. So this technology allows cotton to be processed a lot faster. And the faster you can process cotton, the, the more cotton you can get into uh, 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 its final form to be produced for the textile industry. So cotton is going to become king in the South. But here's the issue with cotton, when you're growing cotton. Cotton exhausts soil. So you grow cotton season after season after season, eventually that soil is going to need to take a rest to rejuvenate itself. So you have to grow other crops and do other things. It's not, uh, it's not something that you, can be sustainable season after season after season. So you constantly need new lands to expand to to grow cotton. So when this Louisiana territory opens up, and the same time the cotton gin is created, the southern planters are saying, wow, we're about to get even richer. So what we need, we need more territory to grow cotton. We need to move more enslaved people into these new territories, places like Texas, places like, of course, Louisiana, Arkansas, all of these areas to the west of the Mississippi. When this occurs, the key understanding of slavery among the enslaved, one of the key things that they hold on to is family. Family is incredibly important to all people, but especially the enslaved people. And not even just biological family, but of course the family you made on the ships, the family that you make on plantations, on farms, in towns. These, these bonds 
or what sustains you in the face of the most brutal system of dehumanization that we can think of. So as African people are forming families, while all this is happening, the new terror among enslaved people is the idea that their families are going to be split up, and people are going to be sold further and further south and further and further west. That's the number one fear of enslaved people. It's not whips, it's, it's, it's not rape, it's not uh, mutilation. The number one fear is being displaced from your family and never to be heard from again. It's like a premature death. So when Harriet Tubman's family, when the owner of Harriet Tubman's family dies, the sons take over and they realize, I think, that their father was in a tremendous amount of debt. And one of the ways to get out of debt is you got to sell some of your property. And by property, they mean enslaved African people. So Harriet Tubman's family has realized that they are about to be split up. There's a possibility that they're going to be split up because uh, the master is going to sell people to Alabama, Louisiana. And on a side note, while all this is going on, with that land opening up, don't think of it as just barren land with nobody there. There's indigenous people there. So part of that process is also clearing out the indigenous people. So there's a whole genocide that's happening on that side of, of, of Mississippi as well that we have to be cognizant of and always remember. So that's happening as well. Indigenous people are being pushed, exterminated, pushed west, making room for Europeans to bring in Africans to exploit. And the Americans are different than what was going on in Haiti because for the most part, they're not getting Africans from Africa. Again, this is not like Haiti. This is not like the other places where they're directly importing Africans. They're separating families, and they're breeding Africans. The Americans wanted to breed African people. They realized, we don't want to keep import. We don't want to be like Haiti. If you import these Africans directly from the continent, they know freedom. They're more likely to revolt violently. So let us make Af let's breed Africans so that they come up in the system. That, doesn't, that never stopped them from revolting. I mean, it was a miscalculation. But that's what they thought. So they're breeding Africans. They have breeding plantations where people are, are forced into this horrible sexual slavery and, and, and just to breed Africans. Families are being split up. And this is all happening in the 1820s, 30s, 40s, into the 1850s. So by the time we get to 1849, Harriet Tubman and her brothers in Maryland decide Let's, let's get free. Before they break us up, before they, they separate the family, let's get freedom. So they decide to run north. But at the last minute, her brothers decide not to go with her. The very last minute, her brother's like, eh, we're scared. So Harriet Tubman, at age, she would have been 29 in 1849, decides to run by herself. And she goes from Maryland, crosses the border into Pennsylvania, gets to Philadelphia, which at the time had the highest population of free Africans, because the North had followed the example of Britain. And of course, there's not a lot of plantation agriculture in the North, so they didn't need slaves, uh, enslaved Africans to be the basis of their economies in the North. So they had already abolished slavery in Pennsylvania, Jersey, New York, and many of these places um, at, at this time. But Pennsylvania was one of the first. So they, she gets to Philadelphia. Um, and she gets free. And then she eventually goes up to upstate New York. But she realizes that she can't be free unless her family's free. The whole reason that her and her brothers decided to escape slavery was to keep their family together. So she goes back into the South, where she's wanted, where, she, where people are looking for her. And, and the family, of course, wants to recoup their property, the, the slave owners. And she frees her brothers. And she frees the rest of her family. And she could have stopped there. She could have stopped there. I mean, that, that's courageous enough. We talk about a woman that got freedom, then went back and freed her family. That would have been a story in and of itself. But Harry Tubman said, well, if I free my family, and I've been successful at doing this, let's free everybody else. Let's free as many people as I can. So she has this circuit where she would go and this is young Harriet Tubman, so you can see. And she becomes one of the greatest conductors on this network of folks, Africans, indigenous people, and sympathetic whites that form this underground railroad, this network of folks getting people from the south to the north. So when Harriet Tubman escapes in 1849, the goal is to get to the northern states, Pennsylvania, New York, Ohio, 
uh, Massachusetts, places like that. And Africans are using all types of methods, African men and women. And this is one of the key forms of resistance. They're escaping. We have the uh, story of one African woman who was relatively light-skinned, who dressed as a man, and she was married to a, a, another brother that was enslaved. She dresses as a man, and she passed as a white man, and had her husband uh, presented as, as, as her slave, and made it all the way to freedom. You got somebody like Henry Box Brown that put himself in a box, mailed himself to freedom. You had people that were escaping via ship, like Frederick Douglass escaped on a ship. You had all these ways of Africans resisting enslavement. The, the closer you were to the north, like Harriet Tubman, the easier it were that you were able to escape. She's right on the border with Pennsylvania and, and Maryland. Um, but even the folks in, in the deep south found ways to escape. They would go into Florida, which before uh, the, the middle of the 1800s was independent. First it was controlled by the Spanish, then the British. Africans would, would, would escape there. Africans in Texas would escape into Mexico. And so you had all these different routes of escape. But Harriet Tubman becomes one of the most successful operators in this Underground Railroad. So she lived in upstate New York. She would make, raise money for her trips by working as a domestic uh, a certain part of the year. And then she would make her way into the South, into Virginia and Maryland and places like that. She would come into the slave community disguised as an old woman, um, all types, she was a master of disguise. She would let the enslaved people know that she was there. The rumor would get around and she would tell people, all right, we'll leave it at a certain time, certain place, be ready. We got to travel by night. Um, she carried a gun and that gun was for two purposes. One, to protect the party of people that she was with. But that gun was also for if anybody got in the middle of the uh, 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 travel and decided that they want to turn around, that gun was also for them. Because if you got scared and wanted to go back to the plantation, you could jeopardize the entire mission. So that gun was also for them <laughs> as well. So Harry Tubman wasn't playing games with people when she said, it's time to go, and we going, and we not turning back. That's what was going on. It's part of the tradition that her grandfather, who was born in Africa, who had this Ghanaian connection, taught Harriet Tubman about the forest and about how to navigate the stars and, and, and these types of things. So she was an expert at this. Even during enslavement, she wasn't a, 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 a house servant. Harriet Tubman had to work in the fields. Harriet Tubman had to work in the woods. It's almost like a lumberjack in different areas and times of her life. Harriet Tubman also suffered from seizures and a neurological disorder that was brought on by getting hit in the head by weight by, by one of the, the owners in, in her childhood. So she would have these spells where she would pass out and, have, uh, and, and times. And when she did that, sometimes she would hear the voice of God and she would talk to God. So she had this connection to spirituality that also pushed her through. Again, this connects her with people like Nanny and Cecil Fatima and some of these other figures that we've talked about who all relied on their spirituality for strength to help them get through these periods. So every time she's making these trips, these circular trips from upstate New York down into uh, uh, the south and bringing people back up, she becomes more and more notorious. And the slave masters have wanted signs. And she becomes the most wanted woman in America. The bounty for her was incredibly high. We talk about, in today's money, millions of dollars. And when she's escaping, again, at first she's taking people to upstate New York, but eventually they have to go to Canada. She eventually moves to Canada herself, St. Catharines, Canada. The reason why they do that, 1850, the North and the South come to a compromise uh, because a lot of the folks in the North, they want slavery over. They want slavery abolished. Again, just like the British, it's not because, you know, of some great humanitarian reason. Some people had that position that, yeah, slavery is wrong, we should abolish it. But the North is like, yo, we're looking at what the British are doing. This free labor thing, it's a lot cheaper, it's a lot more efficient. It's, it's backwards what y'all doing in the South. We try to advance as an industrial nation because the North is moving to uh, another form of development. And the South is stuck in this agrarian, uh, almost feudal type order. And the North is trying to pull the South into the new century. They're saying, listen, industrialization is it, free labor. The British have showed us the way. This is how you exploit Africans. Look, y'all can still grow the cotton. You can still exploit these Africans. We're trying to tell you there's another way to do it. It's actually going to be cheaper in the long run. But the Southerners don't want to hear that. So this conflict is brewing. But in 1850, they come to a compromise. And part of that compromise is a law called the Fugitive Slave Act. The Fugitive Slave Act says this. Prior to 1850, if you got to the North, you were free. Nobody's coming to get you. But the Fugitive Slave Act says, 
if any Africans get to the north, whether that's New York, Ohio, Massachusetts, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, it's incumbent upon the folks in the north to return those people to slavery. That the authorities in the north have to cooperate with the southern uh, owners to bring those people back into slavery. So being in the north no longer made you safe anymore. This is why people are going into Canada. So this is where the whole idea of Canada being the land of promise for African people comes into being. Now, there had already been Africans in Canada. Of course, Canada has owned slavery, and people have been escaping to Canada even prior to this. But now it's more important, more crucial to get people into Canada. And Harriet Tubman becomes one of those folks. And she's in St. Catharines, and, and she's still doing her thing. So she's moving people into Canada. So she goes to Canada. She's in upstate New York, goes down to the south, frees people, frees people. And she's continuing to do this all the way up to the beginnings of the US Civil War, which sparks off in 1860. But just prior to the Civil War, Harriet Tubman is engaged in this very uh, powerful struggle that very few people know about. And it's called the Battle for Charles Nell. The Battle for Charles Nell. Charles Nell escaped slavery in Virginia in 1860. He makes his way up to upstate New York, but this is Again, 10 years after the Fugitive Slave Act. So he's not even really safe in New York. Now, he was supposed to go straight to Canada, but he decides to stay in Troy, New York, because he wants to connect with his wife and children and get them all together before they go into Canada. So he's in Troy, New York. He gets captured by the authorities in Troy, New York, because they have the obligation to return him to enslavement in Virginia. So they have him confined. Now, circumstances made it so that Harriet Tubman happened to be in Troy, New York at that time. Harriet Tubman finds out about this because the black community is talking to him, like, oh, so they captured Charles now. He's being held up over there. Harriet Tubman's like, we're going to go get him out. So Harriet Tubman disguises herself as an old woman. She makes her way near where he's being held. She goes to the window, and she gets his attention. And she motions for him, you know, climb out the window. And while all this is going on, the folks down uh, 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 have started protesting. The black community, sympathetic whites, just start protesting. The authorities come out to meet the protesters. There's a melee that's happening. Uh, and while all this is happening, he climbs out the window. Harriet Tubman takes him to another town in New York. When he gets to that other town in New York, he gets arrested again by some vigilantes. They're like, no, nah, we, we heard about the story. They arrested him again. Harriet Tubman finds out about it again. She and another group of armed folks. So these people ain't coming non-violently. They're not coming to petition. They got guns. A melee ensued, and he's freed again. And then eventually, the black community raises, I think, about $650 and actually buy his freedom. But this is after all of these struggles. And again, Harriet Tubman said, I, we, and this is, a, this is not a, a painting at the time. This is a painting later. But this shows you the fearlessness of this woman. She, she could have let him stay in jail. She didn't have to risk her life, her own freedom, to get Charles Nell out of captivity. But she's like, if I am in the vicinity of anyone enslaved or has the threat to be enslaved, I'm going to do everything I can to free that person. And that's what she did, by any means necessary. She used disguise, disguise herself as an old woman. She used the uh, uh, guns. I mean, there was an armed battle. Shots were fired in that second battle to get Charles Nell free. Uh, and, and they finally do it. So this is the type of person that Harriet Tubman was. But she's going to get even more uh, uh, famous and even more, she's going to show her ability to free people even more, more so than the 13 to 19 times that she went to the South and freed 300 people. Because that's the traditional number. The Harriet Tubman freed about 300 people through her, uh, as a conductor on the Underground Railroad, making her circular trips from North to South. She freed about 300 people. But the story I'm going to tell you now, doubles that, more than doubles that number of folks that she freed. Because three years later, now this is in the middle of the US Civil War. So by this time, the contradictions between the North and the South have gotten to the point where the South has seceded from the US, meaning the Southern states have become their own country. They're the Confederate States of America with their capital in Richmond, Virginia. They're their own country. And one of the key reasons for that is they want to protect slavery. They don't want slavery to be abolished. Now, the North, they're not really interested in abolishing slavery. They don't, there's forces in the North that don't want slavery to spread West, but they're not 
truly, truly interested in freeing African people. And they're really not interested in Africans being equal. In fact, when the war does break out, there's a kind of an agreement between the US and the Confederates that we're going to keep this a white man's war. You don't bring the enslaved Africans in, we won't bring the free Africans in. We'll keep this a white man's war. So Lincoln and the generals in the Union Army, they tell black people like Frederick Douglass and others that want to fight, they say, um, no, nah, you can't join the Union Army. You cannot fight. We, we don't want blacks in the army. Well, that's until the South starts winning the war. In these battles, the South is, is just wiping the floor with the Union pretty much. And it's becoming a long, long war. And the Union just wants to bring these countries, I mean, bring the South back into the United States. That's the whole purpose of it. It's not to free Africans. It's to bring the South back into the Union. But Lincoln realizes that he can't do that unless he allows these free Africans to fight that are chomping at the bit, these Africans in New York, in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, in, in Massachusetts, and even the Africans that went to Canada, they want to come back, people like Martin Delaney, they want to come back and fight for the Union, people like Harriet Tubman. So eventually, Lincoln has to do two things. One, he has to say, I'm going to let Africans fight in the Union. They're going to have white generals. We're never going to let black men be generals. But we're going to allow Africans to fight in the Union Army. And two, uh, Lincoln had to issue the Emancipation Proclamation in January 1863. What this did, in effect, it said that any slaves in rebellious areas are, will be free on January 1st, 1863. What does that mean, actually? That means this. There were countries, I mean, I can't say countries, there were states, excuse me, in the Union that were slave states that didn't actually secede. So places like Kentucky and Maryland and even Washington, D.C., there were still slaves in Delaware. There were still enslaved Africans in these states, and this law didn't apply to them. It did not apply to them at all because those states had not rebelled against the U.S. But in the states that did, Virginia, the Carolinas, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, these places, if the Union Army was able to get into those areas, those Africans would be free. Because the law didn't mean anything because the Confederates were their own country. That would be like Canada making a law for the United States. It doesn't make sense until you can enforce it. So this gave the Africans that have now joined the army a new reason to fight and a stronger reason to fight for the Union. Because they knew if we get into the South, every area that we conquer, we'll be able to free our brothers, sisters, and cousins. So here you tell me, jumped on the opportunity to become a part of the Union Army. She used her skills in espionage as a spy to go into the South, go into communities in the deep South, like South, talk among the enslaved population, figure out what was going on. Because even during the Civil War, the Southerners still relied on enslaved labor for even their military things. It was Africans that planted the bombs on along the rivers that the South would use to fight against the Union Army. It was the Africans that hauled the uh, Confederate Army's ammunition and their guns and their supplies and all these things. So the Africans knew where everything was. The Southern mentality, the Southern racism was so strong and the belief that Africans were so subhuman that Southern generals and Southern military officers would openly talk about their military strategy in front of Africans. So they'd be sitting down on these southern plantations, you know, drinking lemonade and talking about their battle strategy. And the people pouring the lemonade and the people making the food and serving the dishes are all enslaved Africans who are hearing all of this. The southerners are so racist, they're like, these people are subhuman. It doesn't matter if we talk in front of them. It's like talking in front of your dog or your cat or your horse. But what they didn't realize was Harriet Tubman's in these communities. So as they're talking about these things, the Africans are taking the information back to Harriet Tubman. Yo, they're planning on attacking this day. They got this much ammunition. These are where the troops are going to be. And then Harriet Tubman would take that information back to the Union generals. And then they would be successful in fighting their war. Harriet Tubman was also a nurse. Harriet Tubman also cooked for the Union. She did all of these things. But her most important exploit was using this espionage to planning the Combe River Raid on June 1st, 1863 in South Carolina. What Harriet Tubman did, she used the intelligence that she gathered from the enslaved Africans in the black community in South Carolina. And she led the combat mission 
on this night on January 1st, 1863, to take a Union ship full of troops along this river and burn down all the plantations and, and to capture Confederate ammunition posts and other strategic um, uh, points along this river in South Carolina. On this one night, because of her intelligence, and she's actually leading the combat mission. There's a white general in charge nominally, but she's the one that's telling everybody what to do. Go here, shoot here, do all this. Harriet Tubman is leading this. In fact, she's the first woman, not black woman, the first woman in US military history to lead a combat mission, the first woman. And she's never given an, officer, an officer's commission, by the way. She's doing all the work of a commissioned officer and never given an officer, officer's commission. She's doing all this. That one night on January 1st, 1863, she frees 700 people, 700 people, 700 Africans in one night because of what she does leading this combat mission. And this story is hardly ever talked about. They did a recent movie about Harriet Tubman. It came out about four or five years ago. And I was waiting. I was watching the movie. I was saying, are they going to talk about the Combahee River Raid? Are they going to talk about it? It's an epilogue at the end of the movie. They talk about it very briefly, right before the credits roll. They, they, they talk about it really quick. It's, it's outrageous to me how this isn't given. This should be a movie in and of itself. She talks about this later on in life when she's interviewed about her life. And she said it was almost like the children of Israel crossing the Red Sea when they would go to plantation after plantation. They see all these Africans running out to the Union gunboats and the plantations burning down and the Africans running out to get on the ships. And as the Africans got free, they too joined the Union Army to fight against the South. So it's the actions from people like Harriet Tubman, people like the 54th uh, Regiment that came out of Massachusetts that led to Africans uh, getting free in these areas. So when we talk about the Civil War, when we talk about the emancipation of Africans in the US, this is not something that's given to African people. Just like Emancipation Day and these things, these things weren't given to African people. African people revolted. African people fought. African people rebelled every step of the way until their freedom was secured. And even after their freedom was secured, they had to continue fighting. Harry Tubman had to continue organizing. After the Civil War ended, 1865, and the 13th Amendment freed all the remaining Africans, um, with the exception of people that are incarcerated, because that's what the 13th Amendment says in the US Constitution. It says, you can't be a slave in America unless you're incarcerated. And the Southerners used that after slavery was over, and the North, and the Midwest, and everywhere else in America, continuing to this day in 2023, if you're locked up, you can still be put to slave labor. And who are the most, the most locked up population in America? African people the growing number of African women being locked up in US prisons and being made slaves. So that's still going on, by the way. But when slavery ended, quote unquote, Harriet Tubman retires to upstate New York. Harriet Tubman continues to organize for African people because the, the struggle doesn't stop. So even into her old age, she organizes for uh, Africans that were uh, disabled, Africans that get, go into old age and they had lived during slavery, and she wanted them to have uh, you know, an easy time in their elder years. So she starts a home for elderly African people called the John Brown Hall in 1886 in New York, named after one of the greatest white allies black people ever had. Because John Brown hated slavery so much, he wasn't going to just petition the government to end slavery. John Brown and his sons organized a group of whites and blacks and other folks to attack the South before the Civil War. And he actually wanted Harriet Tubman to come with him because he respected her so much. John Brown said this about Harriet Tubman when he met Harriet Tubman. He called, who he called General Tubman. This is even before the Civil War. He called her General Tubman. He said, Harriet Tubman is, is more man than anyone I've ever met. And he wasn't saying that derogatory, like, like she's mannish. He's saying that her heart, her courage, makes her much more of a man than some of these people that I've been around in terms of what we understand man to be. This is the respect that John Brown had for Harriet Tubman. So because of his sacrifice, she named uh, the, 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 the home that she built and raised the funds for because she would give speaking engagements. And she would do these things to make sure that elderly black people had a place where they could be cared for um, and, and, and live their life out. Harriet Tubman was also one of the founders of the National Association of Colored Women, which is the organization that's still, in, 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 uh, in, that's still around today. This organization that brought black women together to talk about the problems that they faced during the after the Reconstruction period, after the period 
following the Civil War, where black people were being lynched, uh, you know, black people were being re-enslaved, black people were in sharecropping situations, black women were being raped, all these things that were happening. Harriet Tubman, at a very old age, is still active, is still saying, the war is over, but we need to still organize. We need to uh, have black women uh, create an organization of their own. We could fight against sexism. We could fight for education of all black people. We can fight for uh, better health care. All of these things, women like Ida B. Wells, Mary McLeod Bethune were part of these organizations that were called the Black Women's Club Movement. You have uh, the Negro Women's Movement in Montreal, Canada. These are all these organizations that emerged around this time to protect the rights of black women. Now, very important, we talk about the year 1896 where Harriet Tubman was at the founding uh, meeting to establish the National Association of Colored Women. This is also the same year that Ethiopia defeats the Italians at the Battle of Ottawa to save all of Africa from colonization. But at the same time that Harriet Tubman is establishing this organization, colonization is happening in Africa. So again, right after slavery is over, Europeans say, instead of taking Africans out of Africa to exploit their labor, let's exploit African labor in Africa and now African resources. So all the money that we made from the slave trade and from slavery and the, pro the products that were made in slavery and the finance that went, all that around slavery. We're gonna take that money, we're gonna invest it in industrialization. Britain was the first out the box, then France, then uh, the, the, the Belgians and the Portuguese and the Spanish and the Italians. They're taking all this money that was raised in slavery, reinvesting into industrialization, and for industrialization, you need raw materials, you need iron ore. You need uh, bauxite for aluminum. You need palm oil. You need all these things. Well, where are you going to find them from? You can't find a lot, of them, a lot of it in Europe. You can find some of it in Europe. But you need places where you can really get this material in bulk and on the cheap. And you need the labor to extract these resources from the earth. Africans turn, uh, Europeans turn to Africa. The colonization process begins. When we come back from break, we're going to talk about African resistance, African women-led resistance to colonization, and we're going to focus on Ghana because we're going to look at, the, this is the place where Harriet Tubman's family came from. So we're going to see some other strong women in this same cultural tradition. Uh, so that's what we'll look at. So I'm going to take a break, answer any questions uh, from the chat, and then we'll get back into it. Uh, Daniel, anything in the chat? Yes, there's a question. Um, somebody asked, what do you mean by non-slavery free labor? Good question. So it comes in different forms. But essentially, the British said, in places like Jamaica Wolf, and, and Canada and, and other places that the British control, after 1834, slavery, chattel slavery is over. So people aren't property anymore. But they were put into apprenticeship programs. Well, actually, I shouldn't even call it programs. Apprenticeship exploitation, meaning that you're going to have to work for your former master or somebody else for a certain amount of years. And the penalty is if you don't work for whatever meager wages that you'll get, it's still free, it's free labor, you're not enslaved, um, then you'll be punished with imprisonment, and then you'll be forced to work anyway. So you can either work for a little bit of money, or you can work for no money by being imprisoned. Uh, for, for not being a part of this program. And then even afterwards, if the Europeans still control all the land, control all the means of production, you as an African have to sell your labor to the Europeans to make money to survive, because they own all the land, they own all the industry, they own all these things. So you have to do that. But unlike slavery, slavery, the Europeans had to provide housing, they had to provide a modicum of food, they had to provide clothing, and you know, cast off clothing, these type of things. Free labor, the Europeans are not obligated to provide any of that. They give you meager wages. The wages then that they pay you, you have to go and buy your own food, your own clothes, your own house, build your own house, and you have to do all these things. So ultimately, that money goes back to them anyway. So the British realize this is a better system because the Africans can think that they're free because you're paying them. You, you don't own them. You're not going to separate their families. You can't, you can't do this type of thing. But really, you're not really free. <laughs> You're, because the money that you make is going back to whites anyway. Um, you will be continuously in debt, and particularly in the way that the, the U.S. did it. Because once the South lost the Civil War and they couldn't have slaves anymore, they figured out the sharecropping technique. 
okay, here's what we'll do. All you enslaved Africans who, who don't have land, because that was one of the things that was not given to African people at the end of the Civil War. One of the generals made a promise to, that that's the whole 40 acres and the mule uh, aspect of African American history, where General Sherman and others said, hey, as we confiscate these Confederate lands, we'll give each African family 40 acres and a mule so that they can have land. But that was never followed through by the US government. So you got a huge population a formerly enslaved people that have no money, they have no place to live, they have no land, so where do you have to go? You have to go work for your former slave master. And what he would do, he said, you can have this plot of land to work, and I'll give you the seeds, I'll give you the uh, uh, animals, like the mules and things, the tools, I'll even give you food and clothing, but you're gonna have to pay all that back with the money that you make from the crop that you raise. So you grow cotton, or you grow tobacco, or you grow indigo, whatever. You go sell that, and then the money that you make, we're going to divide it up. Part of it's for your rent, part of it's for the tools and the seeds that you, uh, uh, you rented from me, all these things. And at the end of the season, what ended up happening was the Africans would still be in debt. It, it, you never got out of debt. And then, because they monitored and controlled the educational outcomes for African people, few African people could read or write and weren't even allowed, and even if you could read and write, it's not like the white folks actually gonna show you the books. So even if you raised a crop that would more than cover uh, the, the, the land that you rent, as well as the tools that you use, and then you would have money left over to feed your family and to invest and do different things, you, you wouldn't even know that because they're controlling the books. And if you go to look and say, hey, wait a minute, I know, we, we worked hard, we raised this crop, I know the price of the crop. I know what it was. I know what, the, what this calculates to. I want my money. Then they say, well, we're just going to go ahead and lynch you. We're either going to kill you or we're going to have you in prison. And if so, if, if you wanted to even break out of that cycle, let's say you're a teenager and you say, I see what they're doing to my parents. I'm not going to get involved in sharecropping. I'm not going to uh, get involved in this cycle when I become older. And you decide that I'm going to find something else to do. Well, if you don't find a job quick enough, the authorities will say, you're a vagrant. You're a vagrant. You don't have a job. You don't have anything to do. So we're arresting you for vagrancy. And then we're going to put you in the prison, in a work camp, and even, which is worse than sharecropping, because you're not going to get paid. Because remember, you can be enslaved if you are a, uh, 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 in, in, incarcerated. So we're going to make you work in mines. We're going to make you work on, on the railroad. We're going to make you work. On, on agricultural projects, and it's still quote unquote free labor. It's, it's not, you're not enslaved unless you're, you're locked up. Uh, sharecroppers, you're not slaves. The apprenticeship program in the Caribbean, you're not slaves, and even afterwards, you're not slaves, but your labor is still controlled and exploited by somebody else. So that's what I mean by uh, uh, free labor uh, and, the, and the economic advantages of free labor. It's a good question. Was there something else? I think Mr. Thomas had his hand up. Uh, Good morning, Ron. Do we know why Sierra Leone was so, the so-called house of refuge, considering that Sierra Leone was known for gold and they weren't sending them, them there for the gold? Yeah. Um, the British needed a, a place to be their headquarters for their expedition uh, to stop the slave trade. So that's what it was set up for. And then through the, um, the Africans in Nova Scotia saying that they don't want to be in Nova Scotia anymore, it also became a, a convenient place for that. Now, the exploitation of gold in Sierra Leone, I'm not sure when that starts in large scale. Um, I have to go back and check that. I'm not sure if they were really thinking about it as a gold-producing place at that time. Primarily, the British company that set up Sierra Leone was primarily focused on having this base for British operations, at first in the slave trade, but then later on, Sierra Leone becomes the base for British expansion throughout West Africa, and it became a place where the descendants of the Africans from Nova Scotia, as well as the Africans from Jamaica and other places where were free, uh, were indoctrinated into British yeah. imperialism, and many of them became the troops of the West African Rifles, who we'll talk about soon, who helped with the 
uh, imperial conquering of Nigeria and Ghana and uh, the Gambia. The Gambia, not so much, it wasn't as violent, but uh, really Ghana and Nigeria and West Africa um, as well. So that was really what the establishment of Sierra Leone was about. But even in that, though, Africans were able to carve out their own cultural spaces. And Sierra Leone operated a little bit different than the other settler colony, which was Liberia. Um, Sierra Leone wasn't as bad as Liberia was in terms of the relationships between the Africans that came uh, from the Caribbean and Americas and the Africans that were already in that territory. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Though. There is something else in the um, chat. Somebody said, maybe I've asked this question in a previous class before, but is there anyone you see today as a contemporary to Harriet Tubman in terms of courage, diversity of talent and skills, and broad contributions to the to different needs of the African descended community? Mm. Harriet Tubman was, is one of a kind. Um, this is why this ancestor is somebody that we should all honor as much as possible. Um, but someone in, in today's time, I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, because the sacrifices that she made, few people are willing to make today, even though we have um, so many more opportunities to get her to get free. We still have mental you know, chains on, on, on our minds. Our imaginations aren't such that we can imagine a world different than what it is. I think that's one of the key things when we talk about Harriet Tubman is she was able to have a vision of freedom that couldn't be broke. And she was going to do whatever it takes to get to that vision. You know, When she escaped, it's not like she had the internet or she had these things where she could see where she was going. She could see the world. Uh, well, what it was going to be. She just knew that freedom was better than her experience that, that she was going through a, a, as an enslaved person. And she was going to struggle for that freedom, whether that even meant up to death. Those of us today, we're comfortable, quite frankly. We're very comfortable. And we won't even do a quarter of the things that Harriet Tubman did to get, to get free. Um, so when that question is asked, I, 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 I won't make it so, so dour. I will say that there are millions of African women that are building communities, that are resisting, um, that are resisting AFRICOM, that are resisting, uh, you know, enslavement in places like Mauritania, that are resisting military control in Sudan, that are resisting. Um, you know, exploitation in Congo and these different places. There's a lot of women like that that are fighting everyday battles whose names that we might not know. Um, in Brazil, in Colombia, in Venezuela, the women that were in Black Lives Matter movements in, in Canada. And so there's a lot of women that have this spirit. But to say that there's one person that has, that's doing all these things, there's no one I can think of right off the top of my head. But it's important that we look for the everyday resistance, the continued resistance and institution building that sisters all around the world are engaged in collectively um, and, and honor that. And, and not just honor it with our words, but with our own deeds and activities and getting involved in the struggle for development and the struggle for progress um, that we should still be engaged with. Because I think if Harriet Tubman were around today, she would want us to be engaged in the continued project of abolition. When we look at the criminal justice system, when we look at an end to militarism, when we look at uh, you know, the things that she was concerned about toward the end of her life, the elderly care of, of African elders, disabled African people, how, making sure that the entire community is uplifted and taken care of. If we really want to honor Harriet Tubman, these are the activities that we should be engaged in. Um, and we shouldn't aspire to be as much like her as possible, knowing that we might not be able to do all the things that she had, but we should just pray that we get a modicum of her courage and her uh, desire to use all the skills that she had to push our people forward. We need to be involved in, in, in those types of activities. So uh, that's a good question, but I can't think of one person in particular. But that's really good. Any other, anything else in the chat, Daniel? Um, no, that, that's everything. All right, so let me get into this. Uh, 
going into the colonial situation. We talked about colonialism already in week one and week two. Um, we talked about Algeria, which was really one of the first modern colonies, a settler colony, though, in uh, North Africa. And we talked about the African women that resisted against that. We talked about Portuguese colonialism. But right now, we're going to talk about West Africa. We're going to be talking about where you see the Ashanti uh, Confederation uh, highlighted there in what's now uh, modern day Ghana. The British had been on the coast of Ghana for some time. Of course, the coast of Ghana was one of the key areas where enslaved Africans came from. Uh, we talked about these Akan, the Coromante Negroes that rebelled in so many places. This is the area that we're talking about. But for most of the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s, and into the 1800s, Europeans are pretty much confined to the coast of Africa. They're not making their way in, inside until that industrialization that I talked about and the need for raw materials and labor really upticks. So what do the British want from the Ashanti? Why are they in Ghana? They're there on the coast for first the slave trade, but then when the British decide to end the slave trade, they want to influence what they call legitimate commerce. The problem is the Ashanti kingdom, and who we're gonna be talking, we're gonna be talking about Yasanti. Well, the Ashanti Garan Confederacy, as we mentioned last week or the week before, had grown during the period of the slave trade and it become this, this confederacy, this empire during that time period. And one of the sad aspects of this confederacy is that many of the sub-rulers in the confederacy had engaged in the slave trade with the British. So when the British decide that they're not going to do the slave trade anymore, that actually hurts a lot of the sub-rulers in this confederacy. And they want to recontrol, they want to take the coast back over from the British because they see them as competitors. And then if the, the British are off the coast, they can engage with the Portuguese or the Dutch or whoever. So there's this fight among the British and the Ashanti over the coast at first. And also with the British allies, the Fanti, another uh, group in the same region. So this is where the battles are happening. The Ashanti say, well, we control the coast and, and, the, and the folks under it, they pay tribute to us and the Fonte should be paying tribute to us and the British are, are, are saying no. So throughout the 1800s, the first part of the 1800s, the Ashanti are actually whooping the British. 1847 they go to war, the British lose. Um, the 18, uh, and lose so much to the point that the folks back in Britain are saying, you know, we might want to rethink just even having a colonial possession in West Africa. Is it even worth it? Is it even worth it to send troops to do this to fight in West Africa? This is the power of the Ashanti Confederacy. In 1874, the uh, British and Ashanti go to war again. And it's a little bit more even at this point. But the Ashanti still come out on top. But by the time we get to the 1880s, and the Europeans at this point are saying, now the, the, the scramble for Africa has begun in the 1880s. The French are in this region. The Germans are in this region in Togo. The French are in Benin. So West Africa is being carved up among the Europeans. And the rest of Africa is, being, is, is a battleground for the different Europeans to control different areas in Africa. So the British are going back to this idea of taking this entire territory from the Ashanti Confederacy. And they're able to do that in the 1880s and 1890s because now the Ashanti Confederacy has been weakened. And this should sound very familiar to folks that have been paying attention over the past couple of weeks. Succession wars, succession wars. As we talked about during the enslavement period, whenever a king or a queen dies and there are these battles for who's going to take over because there's no clear rules of succession, anybody that's related to the royal family through their mother uh, has the opportunity to become the next uh, uh, head of state, the next ruler. So in the 1880s, you had a very powerful queen, num queen mother named Afua Kobe, who is the uh, Asante Hima. She's the queen mother of the entire confederacy. So with the Ashanti Confederation, the Asante Hini and the Asante Hima are the top of the top. The Asante Hini is the king of everybody. The Asante Hima is the queen mother. Underneath them, you have a number of sub-states, which each have the same setup. They each have their own king and queen mother, but they all pay tribute 
to the Asante Hene and the Asante Hema of Kumasi. These, that's the capital. So the most powerful queen mother at this time is a Fuakobi. She uh, has three powerful children. Ya, ya Akaya, who is her daughter, Kofi Kakari, which is a son, and Mensa Bonsu, who's another son. She is so powerful politically that she's able to get her son crowned Asante Hene, Kofi Kakari. Kofi Kakari rules from 1867 to 1874, and apparently he's one of the worst uh, Asante uh, Henny's, one of the worst kings of Asante. He's not good. So his mother actually deposes him. She deposes him. She's the queen mother. She has such political power and cachet that she says, you're not doing a good job. We're putting your younger brother in as the Asante here. So Mensa Bansu becomes the new uh, Asante Henny, the new king of Asante. Well, while all this is going on, her daughter is plotting on her own. Her daughter has her own children, Kwaku and Primpe. Her daughter is also made herself very powerful in business and in politics. And she sees what her mother is doing. And when her brother gets deposed, she's thinking, well, maybe one of my sons could be the next Asante Hima. Because that's how it goes. It goes matrilineally. It doesn't matter who your father is. All that matters is who your mother is. So she plots and eventually gets strong enough that she overthrows her mother and her brother. So this is, this is, what, this is what's happening. A daughter overthrows her mother as queen mother and her brother as a Santi uh, uh, Hima, and she puts her son, Kwaku, on the throne in 1884, the same year as the Berlin Conference. This is all, this isn't done like she doesn't just walk into the room and just take her mother out. Wars are fought. So this is an Asante civil war that's happening. When her son dies relatively quick into his reign, he only reigns for like less than a year, her uncle comes back into the picture. The original one, the original older brother that the mother had put, and this, I know this is getting confusing, but Kofi comes back into the picture. And he's like, wait a minute, uh, I, I was you know, wrongly removed by my mother, I'm going to come back to the picture. And he has his own supporters. So all this warfare is happening among the different supporters of all these people that want to become the king of kings. This fighting weakens this strong confederacy because you got all these sub-states helping their different uh, 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 principles to, to, to fight for this throne. the throne. The stool, actually, the... The symbol of the Ashanti Empire is the golden stool. That's the thing that's, that unites everybody. The Asante Hene sits on the golden stool. That's, that's his symbol of, 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 of the nation. Eventually, after all this struggle, after all this fighting, Primpe I in 1888, the son of Yaakaya, becomes the Asante Hene, becomes the king of kings. And his uncle is killed and all these folks... So now the queen mother is Yaakaya, and Primpe the first is the king. Yaakaya is known in, in history as being one of the most uh, ferocious queen mothers. She'd do anything for the power, anything, to, and her sons are just kind of pawns in this. In fact, when Primpe the first takes over, he's really young. So the person that's running things is Yaakaya. This is when the British make themselves known again. The British come back. And they want to make the Ashanti a protectorate, of, uh, a British protectorate. What that means is simply this. The British would come to African leaders and they say, look, the French are around the corner. The Germans are around the corner. You got African enemies around the corner as well. Why don't you let us protect you? You come under us. We'll give you protection. You have to pay a little taxes now and again but you'll be under our protection. Nobody will bother you. It's a, it's, a, it's a mafia move. It's like when the mafia would come in the small towns back in the day, and they would go up to shopkeepers, and they would say, listen, there's a, lot of, there's a bad element in this neighborhood. Your store might get burnt down, so you pay us some protection money, we'll make sure nothing bad happens to your store. That's the same type of racket that these colonizers are pulling. Yaakaya and Primpe I originally say, no, nah, we don't want to be a British protectorate. 
And when this happens, the British attack Kumasi and burn it to the ground. Um, when this happens, then Prempe the first is kidnapped. Uh, and, 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 and while this is happening, Prempe realizes that it's, this is this is not going to go well uh, for the kingdom. So I'm going to voluntarily go into exile. We're going to have to become a British protectorate, and we'll pay these taxes to the British. And in order for my people to survive and not to be taken out, because they're, again, they're not going to beat the British. The British have better weapons, and more importantly, the nation has been divided because of these civil wars in the 1870s and 1880s. So the, it, it's already in a weakened state. He knows they're not going to win. And the British also have, at their disposal, troops that are coming from Sierra Leone, who are the descendants of Jamaican Maroons, who are the descendants of blacks from Nova Scotia, and other folks that the British had, quote unquote, liberated from slavery, who, who now work for the British and fighting these colonial wars. So the British have these troops. Prempe realizes he's not going to be able to win. He and his mother and a bunch of other of the sub-kings of the Ashanti Confederacy go into exile. So by the time we get to 1895, uh, something important happens. The British governor that's put in charge of the area makes a fatal mistake because after their king is, is put into exile and, his, and the queen mother is put into exile, the British are taking their taxes, the governor still isn't satisfied with this victory. The British governor goes and assembles the remaining kings and queen mothers uh, of the Ashanti, and he says, your king's in exile, your queen mother's in exile, but we don't feel like you people have really done enough. Because they really want to punish the Ashanti, because the Ashanti had been whooping them for a lot, large part of the 19th century. So the, ki the, the governor says, in order to truly submit to Her Majesty, the Queen of England, this is around the time of Victoria, we need the golden stool. And I, as the governor, as a representative of the queen, is, am going to sit on the golden stool, and you're going to recognize that you are truly under British control and occupation. This, some, some of the kings actually were considering it. They were like, all right, well, I guess we, they, they, they won, so let's go get the golden school. Let's go get the symbol of our nation, and let's give it to these folks. But at this meeting, so the, the, the British demand that, and, and the kings and the dignitaries, they all leave the meeting with the British, and they go to another meeting to figure out what, the, what their next step is going to be. As they're debating this, one of the queen mothers, because again, there's the queen mother who's now in exile, but then these the other queen mothers in the other states that are in the Ashanti Confederacy. One of the queen mothers, Ya Santiwa, who's the queen mother of the, the state of Ajesu, Ajesu, she looks at the men that are around her, and she's ad advanced aged at this time, and she says, are you serious? Are you actually contemplating giving up the symbol of our nation to these folks. Haven't they done enough? Because her grandson, who was the king of Ajesu, had gone into exile with Prempe the first. So her son is gone. She's essentially ruling Ajesu as the queen mother. And her grandson is gone. And she said, they took my grandson. They took our king. They took our queen mother. And now you want these, these people are asking for the very soul of our nation. And some of you are actually thinking about giving it to them. She said, I, one of the old oral reports says this, and I, I, I want to read it to you exactly. Uh, she said, men were not fences for any woman to lean against, is one of her quotes. But she says, brave men of our motherland, we face serious confrontation because this, governor in, this governor's insulting demand for our golden stool. We should remember that not long ago, the white man invaded our country and declared our kingdom a British protectorate. Let us not forget that this same white man set ablaze Kumasi, our seat of government, after looting all the priceless treasures bequeathed to us by our fathers. Side note, I'm not even sure all of these treasures have actually been returned to Ghana. Some of them are still in the British Museum. I don't even know if they got them all back. Our king, Nana uh, Ajayman Prempe I, was arbitrarily arrested and deported to foreign lands, together with our queen mother, Nana Ya uh, Akaya, and our leading chiefs without anyone raising a finger. Today, the governor has come to demand for the very soul of the Ashanti nation. Countrymen, shall we sit and accept humiliation by these rogues? Arise. 
She says, resist the white man whose sole purpose in our land is to steal and destroy. It is most honorable to perish in defense than to live in perpetual enslavement. I have seen that some of you fear to go forward to fight for our king. In these brave days, of, in the brave days of old, chiefs would not have watched their king being taken away without firing a shot. No white man would have dared to speak to Ashanti chief of old the way the governor spoke to you chiefs this morning. Is it true that the bravery of the Ashanti is no more? I cannot believe it. If you men of Ashanti won't go forward, then we women will. We will fight until the very last of us falls in the battlefield. I, Ya Santiwa, am prepared and ready to lead you to war. And with this declaration, the men present voted, and they voted that Ya Santiwa, well, first they voted, okay, yeah, you're right. We're never giving the British the golden stool. And two, Ya Santiwa, you will lead us in war. Now, this is very important, because scholars have pointed this out. Oftentimes, the women among the Ashanti didn't necessarily go to battle. And there were a lot of taboos among the Ashanti, particularly dealing with women's menstruation. When women were menstruating, you weren't supposed to be involved in a lot of things. Menstruation was viewed as, 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 a, as a taboo and these types of things. But because she had passed menstruation, she's older, so she's not menstruating anymore. She's eligible to have this military position and to be in this leadership position. So her age made her a very valuable figure in this period of the struggle. So she goes on to lead the troops. She becomes the commander in chief of the Ashanti forces, the Sahini. She provided spiritual, political, and moral fortification for the troops. Just like Nanny of the Maroons did uh, two centuries earlier, Ya Asante was doing the same thing, this time in Ghana, as opposed to outside. She, it's the same function. There's an older woman leading people into battle, fortifying them spiritually, politically, militarily. She saw, oversaw the planning of the resistance and devised strategies to counter the British. She's thinking of all this. They're in council with her. Where she's leading the general. This is what we're going to do. We're going to dig ditches. We're going to put up palisades. We're going to do all these things to fight against the British. Ultimately, though, because that unity that had been uh, present earlier in the century had been eroded due to those civil wars, and because of uh, British technological advantage, they weren't able to completely overcome the British. The British never got the golden stool, but this war was put down. And she was also exiled, along with Prempe I and others, to uh, the Seychelles after the defeat. Um, she eventually passes away, and her uh, a new queen mother in uh, Ajesso was put in, Yaawua, uh, and she was supported by the British. Because what the British would do after these wars in Nigeria, in Ghana, and other places, they would find rulers that they could put in office that would support British uh, uh, colonialism. So this is what happened. But it wasn't without a spirited fight. And as we're going to see next week and, 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 and moving forward, African women during this time period of the end of the 1800s and the early 20th century they fought the hardest fights against the encroaching colonialism. Colonialism didn't just happen. It wasn't just European takeover very easily. The Europeans had to deal with women like Ya Santiwa. This is a statue of Ya Santiwa that's up in Ghana. She's one of the national heroes. You see this statue in a Jesu. So you got Harriet Tubman, who is a daughter of Ghana, leading resistance. Nanny the Maroons, who's a donor of Ghana, leading resistance. You got the women that we talked about in Barbados and Burbies and all these places that were of the same tradition of these Akan women fighting against oppression, fighting against colonization. In fact, the current queen mother of Ajesu is named Ya Santiwa II. So when we talk about these traditions, they continue. They continue. The Ajesu uh, and Daniel, if you wouldn't mind playing that quick video, I just want to play you video so you can see. And sh this woman that is now the uh, 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 queen mother of Ajesu is the great granddaughter, the great, either great granddaughter or great great granddaughter of Ya Santiwa, uh, the first. She Ya Santiwa the second. And this is from earlier, uh, the three years ago, or uh, I think three years ago. Go ahead.
that, sir? Pause it for a second. Uh, Daniel, if you can hear me, pause it. All right, thanks, Daniel. So, I show that to show this is a living tradition. Now, I don't always have the best, uh, I don't agree with monarchies as a way to politically organize. I think it, it causes too many issues like we saw here. But I do respect tradition, and I honor it. And I respect the people that are you know, doing the things that their ancestors do, the way that uh, she is being um, honored. And it's important for us to, to note that. We can have critiques of a political system that doesn't really always serve the interests of the masses, but we could have to still, at the same time, honor um, the, the office and the pageantry around it and what that means, the connection to the ancestors. Because when you look at that woman's face, that's what Yah Santiwa looked like. The physical descriptions talk about it. She was a, a woman that even when she was older, she didn't appear older because that woman is older than what she looks like. She was uh, a heavier woman. They said she was about 200 pounds. And you saw the women that in the picture. That is African beauty, and, and that shows African power and strength that these women still to this day carry on. So I don't know what the politics of the current uh, Ajesu Hima or the queen mother of Ajesu are. I don't know what she does in Ghana, in Ajesu. Um, I've seen, I've only seen a few footage of her. I don't, I don't follow her on social media or anything like that. I've seen her on a cooking show one time, and I've seen that video. Uh, but they are from this tradition. That's why she took that. She has a name, Yah Santi II. Um, very important that we look at Africa and look at these traditions. But more importantly, we look at them and see, OK, well, you have this tradition. You have this lineage. What are you doing? Are you still defending the people's interests against foreign domination or even against the domination of the current Ghanaian state, which a lot of people are having a lot of problems with. Um, I mean, uh, some years ago, the, the government named the highway in Ghana after George W. Bush. There's a lot of questions with that. Ghana has been one of the countries uh, in Africa that have supported the AFRICOM initiative, where US military bases have been set up in Africa. Is she speaking out against these things? I don't know. I can't say one way or the other. But what I can say is that as African people, we need to understand this legacy of resistance and hold our leaders, male and female, to this legacy. If you're going to name yourself Yah Asante II, if that's your name, that's the legacy, then we want to see that. Any other leaders that come at, in these places, if you're in Jamaica and you're a woman politician and you're not operating the way Nanny the Rooms operated in terms of her outlook, on maintaining African sovereignty and African development, then what are you doing? If you're an African-American woman and you're not living your life and organizing your community and doing the things that Harriet Tubman did, what are you doing? If you're an uh, Afro-descendant woman in Canada and you learn about Sally Peters and you learn about the women that uh, established the, 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 the Negro Club Women's Movement in, in Montreal and the others, if we're not living that legacy, then what are we doing? What's the purpose of these classes if we're not taking from this history? and taking these seeds of encouragement and, and applying them to 2023. What is it that we're doing? So I'll, I'll stop there for the day. Um, we will pick up again next week. Uh, and I just want to show these, these monuments to Yah Santawa and Harry Tubman that are in Ghana. So if you visit Ghana, you can see these monuments. Um, we will we'll stop there for the day. We'll pick up next week with some other resistance to colonization led by women. So we'll talk about East Africa, we'll talk about Madagascar, we'll talk about Kenya, we'll talk about the ultimate victory uh, led by the empress of Ethiopia uh, against the uh, Italians. So we'll talk, uh, give some more examples 
of these women uh, leaders fighting against colonization.